Welcome to Discovering. At this time of year, we're thinking deer. We'll take a look at some of the advantages as well as the year-round benefits of food plots. Great way to attract deer into your hunting area. These can be done with uh, like a backpack sprayer and a, and a cedar. These aren't real hard to put in. That's all tonight, so kick back and relax. It's Monday night and time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. At a time when deer have become more scarce than in years past, and issues like CWD are becoming less scarce, food plots are becoming more and more popular as a means of attracting deer. Besides their obvious hunting benefits, they can provide an important year-round food source, particularly at times when deer need it most. I met with John Comp of Northwoods Whitetails in Menominee to find out more. One of the, the best things about a food plot is it presents a consistent food source 24 hours a day. Now, if you think about when you can start baiting, and I'm not against baiting. I know a lot of friends that bait. We've had uh, properties we've had to bait. It's just another method of, of uh, attracting deer. But let's say we're going to compare this food plot to uh, the restaurant and store district downtown Menominee where we're filming at. Uh, every day I get up, I know where the food is. I know where the grocery store is. And my kids know where that is. Their kids know, are going to know where it is. And that's the same way with deer. What we've created with this food plot is the restaurant or the, the shopping district. They know that when they get up from their beds down here about 100, 150 yards away and they're hungry, this is where they're coming. The neighbor might have a feeder or a bait pile, but it's been ingrained into them since they've been fawns. This is where they come to eat. Two years ago, there was a doe bringing fawns here. Now, two years later, those fawns have fawns of their own. They're bringing them to this location because there's been food here 24-7, 365. And you can create that situation on your property with, a, again, this is a half acre, and I feed anywhere from 8 to 12 deer a night. I've seen as high as 20. So if you're not in there disturbing it, uh, they're going to be in there during the daytime. But, it, but when you think about when October rolls around, and guys start putting their, their feed out, they start putting the cabbage or, or the corn or what have you, it, all of a sudden to these, to these upper end bucks, it becomes a pinball game. Well, there's a bait pile over here. Oh, no, I smell, I smell somebody. No, I'm going to go over this bait pile over here. No, I smell some more uh, you know, human scent. And they just kind of stay put or they avoid those areas till dark. A lot of guys talk about October lull and their bait piles, uh, bait stations, the deer not coming out till dark. I'm firmly convinced that it's not the bait that's making the deer nocturnal, it's the pressure. And the deer doesn't care if you're out there bird hunting or filling your feeder or putting corn out. They don't know the difference. All they know is, I smell human scent, I'm not going near that place till after dark. So again, if you have a low pressure, no pressure food plot in, in, in your hunting area and you can get into that hunting area and not have your scent blow into the bedding areas where the deer are, it's, it's going to create opportunities much better in my opinion than you would if you were consistently uh, filling a feeder uh, you know hunting over a bait pile I, I just I've seen it firsthand these these hidden food plots work outstanding we're standing in a half acre food plot in our backyard down here in Menominee and what we've done is we've broken the food plot up into three strips. 
And the reason why I like this food plot system is because there's always food in this, this plot. There's never bare dirt in the, in the complete food plot. What we have here is uh, a brassica planting. This is our sweet feast brassica. It's got three different turnips. It's got forage radish. It's got forage rape, and it's got a hunter forage brassica. And this was planted in July. Uh, unfortunately, when the, when the brassica canopied out about mid-August, we've been hit with a lot of hard rainstorms. And we've got a little bit of white mold, and you'll notice there's a few brown leaves in it, but by and large, it's doing fairly well. Right here, this is uh, our grain mix. This is rye, oats, forage peas, red clover, and some more of our radishes. This we planted in late August. And up above, we've got a, a strip of our white clover blend. Uh, that was planted a year ago. It's a perennial clover. It comes back every year. And this probably gets hit about 10 months out of the year. This grain is going to come back in the spring. The red clover is going to come back. The rye is going to come back. And it's going to feed the deer when they need it the most. They come off those UP winters. They're looking for something to eat. The does are developing fawns, and they're going to start nursing fawns. The bucks are building. Uh, they're, they're starting to grow antlers. And this rye and red clover, as soon as the sun starts hitting it and warming up, snow melts, this stuff is green. I mean, this food plot will be half snow, half green, and they'll be, I've had already 25 deer in this little strip that we're standing in in, uh, in March. So that's very important up in this part of the country is to have food uh, available for those deer when they come off the winter. There's protein here between the red clover and the white clover. When those does are lactating, they, they're, they're raising fawns and those bucks are growing antlers. That protein that's coming out of that white clover blend, we've had it tested in the, in the high 20s, 28, 29%. You just can't get much better food than that, especially when they need it in the springtime. What it's going to do then is this red clover is going to provide nitrogen and the rye is going to scavenge that nitrogen and hold it. Next July, I'm going to till this under and I'm going to put the brassica planting here. So my fertilizer cost is cut back and all this organic matter gets put back into the soil. It's building our soil. And then the, the mix that we're standing in now is going to go down in that strip in August next year. And we're going to just keep rotating that back and forth. And about every six or seven years, somehow we'll, we'll rotate the, the white clover out and we'll, we'll move the white clover strip somewhere else. But again, what I, I really like about this food plot there's always something for the deer to eat. More than likely, you're gonna get doe family to move in here. In October, early November, guess who's gonna start hanging around these food plots? So the bucks are gonna start coming around. There's gonna be rubs on the trees, there's gonna be scrapes all around. Now, if you can imagine, if this was tucked away in a corner or the center of your hunting property, I'm not coming in here every three days to, to bait or to, to, to fill a feeder or something like that. This can be left undisturbed and you can come in with the right wind and hunt this food plot or hunt the corridors leading to the food plot and you're going to have a lot more daytime movement. You're not disturbing the deer uh, by filling a bait station or filling a feeder and that's the one thing I really like about these food plots. This particular food plot, the initial cost would probably be about maybe $300 with all the seed and the prep work, the field work and everything and that, that's this half acre and if you think about the tonnage that's produced on this half acre maybe three or four tons of food for let's just say three or four hundred dollars and if you try to think about how much three or four tons of corn would cost how much would it last nutritional value a lot of tonnage for not a lot of money this is one of the turnips in our brassica planting this is uh, about six weeks old really nice healthy plant you know you get an acre of this stuff and literally tons of food for the deer this is one of our forage radishes right here Really good soil builder, pulls up nutrients, and the deer, uh, late September to early November, absolutely destroy them. This is one of our products we call whitetail forage radish. So there's two different type of food plots we like to talk about. One is the destination feed field, which is what we were just looking at. That's where the deer are going to end up every night, whether it's a food plot you planted or a farm field. Now what we're going to talk about is a hunting plot maybe 20 yards by 10 yards, 20 yards by 20 yards, something you can cover with uh, archery equipment. This would be something that would resemble a hunting plot. It's got oats, rye, uh, peas, you can see there's radishes in there. Uh, really good fall mix for a hunting plot. The grains have kept the, the deer's attention. You can see there's radishes in here, and if you look closely, the rye is still alive and green. 
this is going to keep the deer going from now until November. So, uh, and, and the thing that, that <clears throat> about rye or winter wheat, even if it freezes, it's going to still grow. And uh, so if the deer knock that back, it's, it's not the, they're not going to eat this plot to the dirt. It's, it's going to still regenerate even though it's cold temperatures. You don't need a lot of chemicals to take care of this. Uh, we don't spray Roundup on it. There might be a little bit of grass killer sprayed on the clover. It's very similar to organic farming for deer, this, this particular uh, planting system that we really promote. We like to put these in between their bedding areas and their destination food plots. The deer every night are going to head to that destination feed field. Perfect little spot, two hours before dark, they might stop and get a bite to eat. Or uh, if they're heading there at the feed field all night, you could sneak in here or close to the, one of these hunting plots in the morning, you're going to catch those deer coming back to bed. These can be done with uh, like a backpack sprayer and a, and a cedar. These aren't real hard to put in. You know, again, this one's 20 yards by, uh, it's a triangle piece, 20 yards by 10 yards, and it ends up down to five yards. Uh, you could probably put this in in a matter of about two hours. So a uh, great way to attract deer into your, into your, food, uh, into your hunting area, very low impact. This is a product we call our food plot screen. We've been selling this for three years and we went to a new variety this year of a, a hybrid sorghum. And what this does is exactly what the name says, food plot screen. We've got a county road 15 feet behind me, but we've got deer that'll come out in this food plot two hours before dark every night. Those cars do not bother them because of this screen, okay? If you've got a poaching problem, if you've got a problem with guys shining your fields at night, if you've got a problem with neighbors, you want to increase daytime movement on a great big field, this is by far the fastest way to do this. This screen was planted June 22nd. Now it's 12 feet tall. Great way to increase the daytime movement on your, on your food plots. We've, what we'll do is we'll take a 10 acre field and we'll, we'll take one of the corners, we'll section it off down to two, maybe one acre and plant that. And all of a sudden in a field where deer weren't coming out till right at or at dark, during dark, now all of a sudden, two or three hours before dark, they're up in those fields feeding because they think that 10 acre field is now one acre. In the course of three months, four months, you can have an eight to 10 foot tall screen. If you go about 10 or 12 feet wide, nobody on that road is gonna see the deer in this food plot. If you, if you look, there's a lot of biomass that's gonna be here in the spring. It's, it's, basically, it's basically corn stalk is what it's gonna resemble. So what we'll do is we'll brush, we'll brush hog it, we'll hit it with a disc, bust it up really fine, and then we'll replant it. What I personally do is I'll go two years, a strip here, and then I'm gonna let this rest for two years, and then I'm gonna come back and plant this, and you can keep rotating it. It puts a lot of biomass into the ground. It, it builds some organic matter, but I just, like let, uh, I just like to let the ground rest for two years. We'll probably throw some, some rye or, or something in there just to help that process speed up. What's nice about this particular variety of sorghum that I really like, there's nothing on here for the deer to eat. If you go with, you look at like a milo or a grain type sorghum and it gets seven to eight feet tall and there's a big seed head on it, there's tendency for the deer to want to eat that. There's nothing on here for the deer to eat. And that's one of the benefits of this particular variety of sorghum. Now, if you want to develop a permanent screen, one of the best things to do is to plant Norways or red pine. But while those are growing, that's, that's a six to eight, nine year process. So while those, screen, those trees are growing, if you leave enough room, you can do an alternating uh, planting of this particular sorghum. And then once your trees are up, the, the permanent screen is built, then you can eliminate the need for this screen and then and add more trees. Now you look at this screen over here, that screen was planted July 24th and I can't see the deer on the other side of that food plot if there was any and sometimes that actually will help create more movement in your food plots if you turn them into smaller compartments because some deer just those older uh, alpha does they just don't tolerate other deer in their quote-unquote space so what that screen does is it, it kind of breaks that space up 
another thing it'll do for the rut. A lot of times a buck will step out into a food plot, he's going to look at the whole food plot and see who or what deer are out there. Well now if you've got one or two strips of this put in, in your food plots broken up into sections, he's got to go to each one of those sections now. So if he comes out down on the west end of the property or the west end of the food plot, you're hunting on the east end and you want him down here and you've got, you've got these compartments now that forces that buck to come down to your end and that might be one of the tools you need to put that deer in the back of your pickup truck. Now you can see the, the pressure up here is, is pretty intense. They're, they're on these brassicas really hard. They're eating them right out. They're, they're, these are some of the turnips. They're not really big. They were planted a little bit late. And the other thing that we had a problem with, you can see with the brown, this is that white mold that I was talking about earlier. It's, and again, that's just Mother Nature's way of telling us she's in charge. So one of the things you can do if you get early browse pressure, and we did it over here as an experiment, and you can see if you look at this particular part of the food plot here versus over there, when I knew we were going to have trouble with this, with this particular brassica plot, we came in with uh, 50 pounds of rye. Knowing full well that we had the white mold situation, knowing full well that the, the browse wasn't going to be here like the amount of browse isn't going to be here like there should be, we came and overseeded a lot of the food plot with rye. So now if this brassica is gone or they eat it to the ground, I've still got all this lush rye. And it, it, it's going to stay green all the way down to probably 20 degrees. So all is not lost. If you have a situation like this, whether they the deer come in and start browsing in September, I see that a lot with brassica. The deer will come in in September and start browsing. Or this white mold situation. Uh, it, you know, it's not the end of the world. What we ended up doing is you come in with the, the rye to the rescue. You overseed it with rye. They're going to eat what they want. They're going to eat the greens. They're going to eat the bulbs. And then they're going to come in and eat the rye. When, when guys think about food plots, they right away, I need a tractor, right? You know, I need a, my buddy's disc or, or what have you. Uh, some of the food plots that, that uh, we're going to show pictures of were actually put in with a chainsaw, a push mower, and backpack sprayer. What we'll do is we'll, we'll figure out where the bedding area is, where these, where's going to be the best place to put this food plot in to harvest deer. We'll go in with a chainsaw and take out the bigger trees and all the heavy brush. And then what we'll do is we'll go in with a backpack sprayer probably end of June, early July and spray all the foliage that's coming up, the weeds, anything that needs to be killed. Uh, we use, this is generic Roundup from Tractor Supply. What you're looking for is this glyphosate, 41%. Take about a quart of this to four or five gallons of water. End of June, end of July, and maybe once again in August. And now you've got a, a mat of dead thatch, dead weeds, and it's just laying there. You don't have to work that into the ground like a farmer does. So you go in on that dead thatch and you overseed either some clover or some, so we've got that mix called fall forage, rye, oats, peas, and wheat. And you're just going to spread that on the dead thatch. And it's going to fall in between the cracks and you're going to want to put some fertilizer on it. End of August, you get that nice one or two rains. We start to get a little bit cooler temperatures, dew in the morning, and suddenly you've got this beautiful carpet of green. It, it's not hard to put a food plot in. You, the most important thing about putting a food plot in, you have to have a soil test because you're, gonna, you're just shooting yourself in the foot if you go in and I'm going to guess at the fertilizer, I'm going to guess at the lime, I'm going to put this seed in, I'm going to put that seed in. They, they cost $15, I think, by the time you get, you get the soil kit from your, uh, your, your local co-op, your local uh, ag office, and you get that done, and that basically gives you a roadmap as far as what that food plot needs. We've started this company uh, August 1st, 2012 is when we officially went online selling seed, but we've, we've been selling seed for about five years now. I've been planting food plots for probably 11 or 12 years. Started out with a rye plot, ended up going to clover and, and brassica and turnips and stuff, and, and just really enjoyed the, uh, the way the deer react to something you create. And what we found was we were helping more and more people and I by no means a, am an expert in this field. I just, I've got a lot of experience in 
with the business, I get to talk to some of the sharpest minds in the whitetail industry. They try to point me in a direction that's beneficial to the deer, it's beneficial to the hunter, and we're, we're keeping uh, costs down as much as we can. We're trying to keep things simple too. Um, what we've done is we've packaged everything that we sell in half acre bags, and everything is mixed for you. If you want our brassica mix, that's all you're gonna get. There's no, there's no rye or fillers or anything like that in here. It's just straight brassica. Same thing with our clovers. A lot of, a lot of uh, mixes you'll see on the market today, you'll get a 10 pound bag and it looks like they swept the floor of, of the local feed mill. Put it all in a bag and put a sticker with a name on it and a deer and they're gonna sell it as food plot seed. Well, what I've found is that there's, there's a couple of problems. Some seeds don't go well uh, with others. And, you know, again, when you, when you go to plant this little tiny seed, I mean, you look at how tiny these seeds are. And if you were to throw some peas or some oats or some rye in this bag, suddenly you're, you're planting. Uh, the, the opening in your cedar has to get so much bigger, you're just pouring this seed out. So we've taken a lot of the, that kind of trouble out of our mixes. We, we want hunters to be successful with our mixes. We try to keep things as simple as possible. Uh, the costs are extremely low. Uh, we just have plain packaging because it keeps the cost low. You know, what the difference between this and, and uh, let's say if we were to put a picture of a, a big deer on it and put it in a pretty orange or green bag, guess what? You're still getting this seed and, and, and the deer don't care what the, what the bag looks like. So. We, that's just, you know, I'm just an average everyday 40 hour a week guy and, and, and this is the kind of stuff that I can relate to. I don't, I just, I, I need it to work. I need it to work the first time. I need it to be easy. And we think that our blends are, they're very efficient, they're economical, and I think they work phenomenal. Well, that's it for tonight. If you'd like to keep tabs on what's coming up on Discovering or see where we've been, you can join us on Facebook or go to 906outdoors.com. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering.